Hello everyone and welcome to another Fusion 360 Live. My name is Brad Tallis from Autodesk. I wanted to welcome you to our continuation of the MITRE SAW stand. I know it's been a couple weeks uh, since we did our last one. Um, I got pulled into that furniture, that week-long furniture live stream. Hopefully if you uh, haven't seen it, um, I highly recommend that you go out and watch it. It's out on our Fusion 360 YouTube channel where we spent a lot of time talking about uh, furniture design, manufacturing, arranging, um, cut sheets, etc. Highly recommend that live stream series. Um, I have on the keyboards my friend Angelo, who's going to be helping out today. And I'm going to start by um, diving in, give me just a second here, to um, showing some stuff that we've recently added to Fusion 360 that I wanted to point out, which I think is really kind of cool. Um, so you can see here I have a standard um, little bracket and originally when I wanted to fillet these edges I could come in here and say fillet I would do a radius of 30 and I would get what kind of looked like a full round fillet however if I were to um, change for example the depth to like 80 millimeters Fusion did exactly what I told it to it kept those edges at 30 millimeters and so I had to add this little segment right there well, we've recently added into the fillet menu the full round fillet. Oops. So by default, it's usually set to just regular fillet. But if I click on that, I can say full round fillet. And I wanted to show this to you because it's pretty powerful. So I want to round over this top face that you can kind of see I'm hovering my cursor over. And you'll notice that there's some blue faces that are kind of highlighted. Those are basically the vertical walls. So if I were to click right here, I don't get the result that I wanted, but I got the result that Fusion was telling me. It was basically saying that those two vertical walls were gonna be the tangential walls to the, to the fillet. So as you're playing around with this, make sure you get the results that you want. You'll notice now when I kind of move to the left, now it's highlighting the front and back faces and if I were to click there sure enough it creates a full round fillet I don't even have to type in a radius or anything like that and what's nice about this is if I were to come in and change you know the the thickness of the part or the depth of the part that is always gonna stay a full round fillet so wanted to point that one out to you the other one um, that is really cool is we have that's called Thin Extrude. So you'll notice I have a profile right here. And let's say I wanted to make this like a, an aluminum frame or something like that. I'd have to come in and do an offset and pick you know, each of these um, lines or whatever and specify the distance, etc., etc. And it would complicate my sketch. Well now I can just come in here and say extrude. So I'm going to right mouse click, say extrude, and in the menu you'll see this new icon called thin extrude. So by default it's going to do a regular extrude, but if I switch to this thin extrude, notice what it does. It actually allows me to specify a wall thickness, so um, let me do like 0.05, or this is 0.09 or something like that. And you can see that it's going to automatically create that for me. And I didn't have to do the offset or anything like that. In fact, you'll notice I didn't even trim my profiles. And Fusion is smart enough to do all of that for me automatically. Let's just do 0.125 in this case. And there we go. And what's also cool about this is you can even do it with open profiles. So, for example, I'm just going to draw a quick rectangle here and let's just delete that top line. Well, if I try and do an extrude, you'll notice it doesn't let me pick that profile because it's not a closed profile. However, if I switch to thin extrude, I can now select it and it will allow me to create almost like an enclosure or something like that, for example. Um, so think about how much time we saved doing it like this with the thin extrude versus you know the sheet metal module or creating offsets and all that kind of stuff. 
So wanted to highlight those few things. And then the last thing I wanted to highlight, which I think is pretty cool, is in the text menu, or the text command, I should say. Um, so I can throw some text on this face here. Under the font, it now shows you live previews of what that font looks like. So instead of just the name, we can actually kind of see what um, all the different fonts look like. Kind of a cool little addition. So just wanted to point those out to you. Okay. Um, once again, I have Angelo on the keyboard for me. If you have any questions, please feel free to post them out into the chat and I will try and uh, uh, monitor those and uh, answer your questions as we're going through. So we left off last time we we created this wheel and you'll notice I basically created it at zero zero and so that's why it's kind of you know stuck inside my design right here because we had we turned off this table assembly and you can see sure enough the the origin there so we created it at zero zero obviously it's in the wrong spot we're gonna fix all that and we're actually gonna mount the wheels um, to the end of this stand and that's what we're gonna be working on today I wanted to highlight a couple things that I run into a lot You'll notice, for example, all of my joint icons are displayed. You know, my revolutes, my rigids and stuff, and that gets kind of cluttered. So you can actually um, turn those off by going to this display settings, object visibility, and you can see all the different things you can turn on and off. And one of them is joints. So I'm gonna go ahead and click on that icon there, and sure enough, all of those go away. However, you'll also notice I have some axes that are displayed. Now, one of the things I could do is, you know, find them in the browser and turn them off that way, but that kind of takes a lot of time. So I'm just going to click on it and then right mouse click, and you'll notice it says show hide. And it's kind of hard to see, but the little shortcut key is V for visibility. So I can just go ahead and say show hide, and it's going to hide that axis line for me. So I'll do the same thing or I'll click on it. I'll do the shortcut key of V. Now it doesn't look like it did anything. That's because it's pre-selected. But as soon as I click out into you know the viewport, it will go away. So once again, V as in visibility. So I'm just gonna quickly turn these guys off because, and the reason I'm doing this is um, they're actually hidden kind of in all of these you know leg assemblies I'd have to expand that guy open um, and then expand open the uh, um, construction and all that kind of stuff that were inside of there so that's why I'm just doing it by clicking the uh, show hide really fast way of doing it in fact here's another example I want to turn these guys off okay um, so I'll right click on it and Notice I can say show hide and it made them go away. Instead of trying to find them, in fact, I'll show you how I used to do it. You know, I'd click on it, it highlights, okay, that's in the table assembly under the end cap assembly. You could expand that guy open. Okay, it's under the leg support. I'll expand that guy open. And there it is right there, handle mount, right? So yes, you can do it that way, but that takes some time. Um, I find it much faster to just, you know, click on it, right click, show hide, or hit the V key on your keyboard. Okay, so we are going to mount these this wheel. In fact, we're going to make two of them. So I'm going to activate this wheel assembly, make that my, my current assembly, and we are going to create a sheet metal tab, basically, that goes right where this hole is. To, to mount the axle for the wheel. So I'm going to switch into my sheet metal tab and click on new component. Now when I do that, you'll notice that it's creating a new component, but it's defaulting to a sheet metal component. I can give it a name and I think I'll call this wheel mount. And then I can also see all of the different sheet metal rules that I have. And you'll see somewhere in millimeters, somewhere in inch, 
Some are custom ones that I've made. Um, in this case, we're doing this in millimeters, so I'm going to do this steel millimeters, and it's going to create a sheet metal component for me. You can see that right here. And let's just go ahead and I like to basically create it where it needs to be. So I'm going to click on this face and say create sketch. Now you can see a lot of stuff going on. We've got lots of hardware displayed, our wheels displayed, but that's okay. I want to capture where this circle is. So I'm going to P for project. Hopefully you all know that shortcut key. And I'm just going to project this face right here. I'll say OK. And you can kind of see what it did. It projected where these holes are located. Now I can create a rectangle. I like to use the shortcut keys, so R for rectangle, C for circle, L for line, etc. So I did R for rectangle. You can see it's a little rectangle icon next to my cursor. And I want to do a centered rectangle. And all I have to do is get kind of near the center of that circle. And you can kind of see it snapping to that. And we're going to create a centered rectangle from there. OK, I like to do the length. So I'm going to tab over to the length. That's 62. I'll tab into the height. That's 28, according to the drawing. Um, speaking of which, the um, in the description of the YouTube video, I have the outline. I also have a link to um, the drawing set if you want to use those. Um, this is a pretty simple one, so not too much to the drawings. Uh, but the outline's out there. Feel free to grab that and, and follow along at a later time and see if you can create the um, miter saw stand by yourself. Okay. Okay, so let's continue on here. So I have this rectangle. And remember, we're in the, uh, the sheet metal tab. So I've created basically my profile. The next thing I'm going to do is use the flange command. Now, if I click on this profile, you're going to see a couple things happen. So it's using the sheet metal rule. Oops, too fast. A sheet metal rule, and it's extruding that sheet metal the correct thickness. However, I don't want this hole to be in here, so I'm going to go ahead and also select that profile. And if we look real careful, you can see there's a little tiny profile here that I'm going to want to add also into this. So it creates a perfectly rectangular piece of sheet metal. You can specify which side it goes. Now, I obviously want it to go out away from this other sheet metal part. So that's side one, and I apologize for that. Um, I can also switch to side two. It goes in like that, or I could do symmetric. But obviously, in this case, I want it to go out, and I'll say OK. Now, it doesn't look like a sheet metal part, but it is. If we expand this open, here's the rule that we're using. Here's the body. Here's the sketch. And what this is going to allow us to do is we can now use the flange command to start bending in the metal. So I'm going to pre-select this edge. And you'll notice at about 4 o'clock is the flange command. So I'm going to go ahead and click on that. I like to start to drag. And we can visually see what's happening when we drag this edge. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and select this other edge at the same time. And we're bending that metal. And according to the drawing, the overall height of the sheet metal part is 32 millimeters. So let me type in 32. Now you heard me kind of emphasize the overall height. And that's what this height datum is. So you can see it says outer faces, inner faces, and tangent to bend. Without going into too much detail, outer faces is basically it's measuring from this outside edge right there to this edge here is going to be 32 millimeters. So the overall height is 32 millimeters. If I said inner faces, you can kind of see it grew a little bit. That's because it's now measuring, and I can't really highlight it, but it's measuring this inside face to here is 32 millimeters. So it's actually more like 34 and a half millimeters tall now because it's the thickness of the material. So 
I said overall height, so I'm going to say outer faces. It's going to go from this outside edge to that outside edge. Height of 32. Okay, and I'll just say, okay, we'll leave everything else alone. And we've just created this pretty quick sheet metal component. Much easier than, again, doing like an extrude or a profile and all that kind of stuff. I really like the sheet metal tool. My zoom is really jumpy, I apologize. So here's another tip I'm gonna show you. I want to basically fill it all four of these edges. So I'm gonna select all four of these. Now I have to be really careful. You'll notice it's not even letting me select this edge. So I need to zoom in a little bit more and select that edge and select that edge. And that took quite some time to manually select all of those. So here's a neat tip. I'm going to create a fillet and then I'm just going to basically look at it from the side like so. And I'm just going to draw a box like that and actually let me, um, oh that's in full round, let me go fill it. <laughs> so I kind of look at it from the side, I'm just going to draw a selection box like that and you can see it's selected that edge there and that edge there. It's kind of hard to see but they're highlighted blue. And I'll do the same thing again. I'm going to hold down my shift key and just draw a window around that. And you'll notice it says four edges. Now, why couldn't I just go like so? Well, then I'm going to get a lot more, right? I'm going to get a bunch of edges, a bunch of faces that I don't want. But instead of having to zoom way up and all kind of stuff, I literally can just drag a box, drag a box, and I'm done. I've selected those four edges that I want. And I can specify the size. So in this case, I want to do a 10 millimeter fillet, and you can see how quick that was. If you uh, if you like that, give us a thumbs up. Neat little, I try and throw in these tips and tricks every once in a while. So I'll say okay. We've got our 10 millimeter fillets on there. Now we need to create a hole for the axle to go through. I love to use the hole command. Well, you'll notice I'm still in the sheet metal tab and I don't see the hole command in here. If I go into create, it's in here, for example. Um, but one of the things I really like about Fusion is I can jump back to the solid tab and do like solid stuff, add chamfers, add holes, you know, punch a profile through it and all kind of stuff and it's still a sheet metal component. So I'm going to switch back to this solid tab and there's my whole command right there. So I'm going to go ahead and click on it and I'm just going to pick on this face somewhere like so. Okay. Now you'll notice a couple things. Let me uh, pan around here a little bit. You can see it's set to distance. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and extend this a little bit further just so you can kind of see what's going on. Okay. We're going to make a couple changes and we're going to do a cool little tip and trick here. So the first thing I want to do is I like to set my diameter of the hole and it's actually correct. Let's just say it was 6 originally. I'm going to change this to 12 and I get the preview when I do that. The next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this blue dot. <laughs> And it's hard to, sh to point them out, but you'll see three white dots kind of in a triangular shape. <laughs> Again, it's kind of hard to see maybe if I move off of it a little bit. You'll see those three white dots. Those are snap points. This first one here is the center of the fillet that's up here, right? The other one down here is the center of the arc or the fillet down at the bottom. And this last one right here is the center of that whole face. And that's where I want the hole to be. So instead of having to do dimensions or create a sketch or anything like that, I can literally just drag these to, you know, the corners or to the center of the face and it snaps right to it. I love that tip. If you like it, give us a thumbs up. If you're learning new things, please let us know in the comments. We always like to hear 
uh, what you guys like or don't like about these videos. Okay, so I have it located in the right spot, but the depth, um, I don't like to use distance. I like to say, go through all, and it's gonna figure out how far that hole needs to go. And the reason I like to use all is if we were to come back and change the size of this bracket for whatever reason, I always want that hole to go all the way through it. If I had set it to a distance, let's just say, you know, 62 or whatever, and then we change the length of this bracket, it would no longer go all the way through. It would only go the depth of 62. So I recommend all in this case. Diameter 12, everything looks good. I'm gonna go ahead and say okay. And we just created this bracket pretty quickly. <laughs> Again, if I were not talking, if I were just to do it, I'd probably have this thing modeled in a minute or two, basically. And think about how, what steps it would take to do that without sheet metal, just using you know regular commands. You'd have to create a sketch and offset it. You'd have to know the fillet radiuses. Sheet metal does all of that for me. Okay, now I want to um, copy this and put it over on this other side. So here's my wheel mount. To copy things, you kind of have to be at the higher level. So you can kind of think of this as a child, and we need to be, we have to ask the parent <laughs> to copy the child. So I'm going to activate my wheel assembly, and then I'm going to right click on wheel mount. And there's a command in here called move copy. You also see copy here. They're literally the same command. However, this one allows you to move and copy at the same time. This is more like a copy and paste, and then I'm gonna position it. So I like to use this one, move copy. What do we wanna move? We wanna move the sheet metal component. It already knows which one, because we right clicked on it and said move copy. So it's kind of filled that in for me automatically. By default, it's usually set to this free move where we're gonna use a very specific move. I, I know exactly where this bracket is, and I know exactly where I want it to go. So I'm gonna use this point to point. Now when I do that, the very next thing I want to make sure I do is select create copy. Because if I don't, it's just gonna move it. <laughs> so I'm gonna say create copy. And then it's asking what's the origin point and what's the target point. So I'm gonna click on the origin point and I'm gonna rotate so we can see basically the back side. We can see um, this circle right here, right? Well, there's another one over here. So we know the two locations. So I'm gonna click on that circle there. And then I'm gonna make sure I grab the same circle. I don't wanna grab this one down here because I grabbed the, the top edge over here so I want to make sure I grab the top edge over here and it moved and copied that bracket into the correct location now I could have done a copy and just moved it out in space somewhere and then used the joint command and position it with a joint command totally valid but you're gonna see that I didn't have to do that here, and we're gonna kinda group things together using rigid groups. So it basically saves me a step not having to um, create an extra joint that's gonna basically get written over anyways. Okay, so we now have the two brackets. The next thing we're gonna do is create the axle that goes through these. So, kind of organizing things. I'm kind of keeping everything underneath my wheel assembly. So I'm going to right click on wheel assembly, new component. I'll give it a name. Please name your components instead of component 86 and component 87. You know, give them a name. So I know this is going to be the wheel axle or the wheel shaft, whatever you want to call it. I'll say okay. And I now have this wheel shaft that's active. Well, an axle is pretty much a cylinder, so I could create a sketch, could create a circle, extrude it, etc. That's multiple steps. Or I could use one of these primitives. So under the Create menu, 
you can see we've got box primitives, cylinders, spheres, etc. I'm just going to create a cylinder primitive. And the axle kind of needs to go in that direction. So I'm just going to go ahead and click, for example, on this front face. And that's going to allow me to draw this primitive. Now, I'm just going to click sort of near it. I'm not going to put it exactly where it needs to be. I'm going to put it right here and the diameter is 12 millimeters okay now I'm going to zoom out a little bit so we can kind of see in 3d then I can start to drag this direction and you can see that it's creating a cylinder that's 12 millimeters in diameter now the length I'm gonna give it in inches and, and the reason I'm doing this is I want to show you a, a neat tip um, even though I'm in millimeters, I can use other units like centimeters, feet, whatever. So for example, um, I mean, I could type in 180 for millimeters, or I could type in, for example, you know, 6IN. And notice that it's going to figure out, in this case, it's 152.4, <laughs> even though I'm typing in 6IN. So you can do different units. Um, and actually in this one I, I did have as millimeters, I got ahead of myself. The next one we're gonna do um, inches and stuff. So um, in this case it is 180 millimeters. So I'll say okay. And we just create under primitive that's 12 millimeters in diameter by how long. I'm gonna chamfer both edges. Pre-select the edge, right mouse click, chamfer, let's do one and I'll go ahead and select both those edges so we get both of them I'll say okay now I need to thread both ends but I don't want the whole thing to be threaded so this is a cool command I'm gonna come in here and say create thread and it's asking for the faces oh, I hope I'm still sharing um, so, Angelo, I'm looking at YouTube is not sharing. Can you ping me real quick on the uh, shared doc if, if we're still streaming, okay? <laughs> I hope we are. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put a thread on this face right here, and you'll notice that it's going all the way, the whole length of that rod. And that is this option right here. Um, okay, all fine, thank you, Angelo. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to go ahead and uncheck full length and notice what happened. It actually gives us the ability to, you know, change the offset. I could say like 10, for example. So it's going to thread, you know, 10 millimeters in. Obviously, you wouldn't do that. So I'm going to set that back to zero. But it's allowing me to specify a length. In this case, I'm going to do 12 millimeters. It also figures out because this was a 12 millimeter diameter shaft, it kind of figured out the threads for me, but I have lots of options in here to specify what kind of threads, what size and everything. I'm just gonna go ahead and say, okay. And you'll notice it puts basically like a decal. It didn't physically thread those, and I don't really want them to be physically threaded. It's just a representation that the end of this rod is threaded. Well, I also want to do the same thing on the other side. So we'll create a thread. I'll go ahead and click on here. And again, it does the whole thing, but I'm going to turn off full length and notice it still remembers the threads on that side. And now we're creating threads on this side. We'll say 12. And remember I mentioned earlier, it's basically like a decal. It's not physically modeled. Well, right here, I could say modeled and it will physically model them but I don't really want to in this case I'm gonna turn that off and I'll say okay um, okay so we've threaded both ends of the rod which is pretty cool and this those threads will even show up in the drawing when you go ahead to create a drawing so now I want to position this in my sheet metal bracket so I'll go ahead and use the joint command to do this. So I'm going to say joint. And I'm going to basically grab this little edge right here. 
Now, if you haven't noticed this recently, we've, we've changed our, our little icon and it's hard to point out, but it actually has the little axes sticking out. So you can really visually see like which direction is Z and X and Y, for example. Um, previously, we just had that little half moon icon. I really do like this new icon that we use. So I'm gonna click on this edge here and I want to line that up with this edge here. And watch what this does, okay? It did exactly what I told it to. It lined up those two edges. You can kind of see the chamfer sticking out just barely. Now, um, I think it looked like it was doing a revolute. Sure enough, it, it was. I'm gonna go ahead and change that to a rigid. And I'm gonna go back to position. Now, I don't know if you've noticed this before, but whenever you create a joint, you see this rotation and these arrows. Well, what does that mean? Well, I'm going to grab this arrow here, and I can actually slide the location, and in this case, the Z offset, of where this joint is. So remember we lined up basically the, the edge of this chamfer with the edge of this hole right here, and that would be zero but now I'm pulling it a certain distance away. In fact, I'm gonna say um, minus 15 in this case, and I'll say, okay. And I positioned it exactly where I want it to be. I get this question a lot is like, well, I'm limited to lining up edges with edges and faces with faces and stuff like that when I create a joint. And that's kind of true, but then you always have the ability to offset those. So, this joint is actually lined up from here to here and then we offset the 15 millimeters so hopefully you learned something new there what i'm going to do now is bring in a washer and a um, nut and i actually just thought of another thing i wanted to show you um, i'll show at the end of some new functionality in fusion i'm going to insert a mcmaster car component And let's just take a look at this. I'm gonna stretch it out a little bit so it's a little bit easier to kind of see what's going on. Now I could search for these, um, but I, just, I wrote down the exact ones I want. So I'm just gonna search for the product name. So 98689alpha118. And I'll just search for that and you'll see that it found a metric general pur purpose washer, metric 12, so, you know, and that's the number I searched for. I'll just click on this guy and say download. Now, you see how quickly it brought it in, but it brought it in at like zero, zero. So I'm going to drag this over. I don't have to be exact, but I kind of like to bring it over kind of near where it needs to be, right? Just kind of in this general area. And I'll just go ahead and say, okay. Then I can come in and create a joint. So I'll say, I wanna create a joint there. I'll grab you know, either this edge or this edge, it doesn't really matter. And I want to put it up against that edge right there. And you'll see it brings the washer, positions it right where it needs to be. I'll just go ahead and leave it a rigid joint in this case. I'll say, okay. And we'll do the same thing. I'll insert another McMaster car component. I think it's auto saving there. Drag this a little bit bigger so you can kind of see. Um, in this case, I'm gonna do a nylock nut. So typing in the search 94645 alpha 230, search for that. And sure enough, you can see nylon insert lock nut, metric 12. So I could have searched for it just by saying I want a nut, I want it to be a nylock nut, I need it to be metric, I need it to be metric 12, but just to save time, I'm just searching for that number. So I'll say that guy, download. And instead of me having to model this or whatever, let somebody else do the work for me, right? So I'm just gonna bring it in for McMaster car. Kind of position it where I want it, in that general area and I'll go ahead and create a joint. I'm gonna grab like one of these circular edges to grab that center. You can kind of see that little tick mark in the middle, which is really, again, I really like that. So I'll click there. 
position it on the washer right there and there we go I'll say okay well I need the exact same washer and the exact same nut on the other side so um, I want to basically copy these so let's go ahead and expand open the wheel shaft assembly I'm going to scroll down and here are those two parts so I'm going to control select both of those right mouse click and I'm going to say move copy now this time I'm not going to use point to point I'm going to use a couple different ones I'm going to use this free move so I'm going to click on free move then the next thing I want to do before I move I want to say create a copy that way it knows to leave the originals and I'm just gonna drag these over here and we can see that sure enough it's copying them and then I'm gonna rotate those around 180 degrees now I can come in and say point to point so we're actually doing multiple ones here we did a free move to kinda of get it out here in space now I'm doing a point to point and I basically want to line up um, you know like maybe the edge of this face or whatever with the edge of my chamfer there and you can see it it snapped it back looks cool. and I'll say okay and I've just copied those parts so there we go you can kind of see there's multiple ones there okay now I'm ready to bring the wheel and put it onto this axle if I um, click on just the the wheel you'll notice it pulls off of the rim we didn't create any kind of joints or anything like that so I'm gonna revert back and I'm going to select the wheel hub and the wheel right mouse click and in here is a command called rigid group so I'm gonna say rigid group I'll say OK and now if I grab the wheel we can see that they both the hub and the wheel move together and if I move one the other one's gonna have to move with it okay now this table is kind of in the way <laughs> there's a lot of stuff here I don't need to see the table for this next thing so I'm gonna hit the little eyeball next to table assembly and now we're back to this and I'm going to activate my um, wheel assembly so we can kind of see all this is kind of grouped together and let's create a joint so I'm gonna say assemble and I want basically this face to ride up against the washer here so that's what we're gonna end up doing so I'm going to hover over this face and we can see you know we can grab that center mark right there so it's gonna find the center of that hole and then I'll rotate and whoops too fast too far click there and you're gonna see the hub moved <laughs> but the wheel did not and again this freaks people out but this did exactly what I told it to. It moved the face of that hub to the face of that washer. Well, I want it to be a revolute joint, so I'm gonna say revolute. We can kind of see what that looks like. And as soon as I say okay, you'll see that that rigid group had to update, and now this wheel is exactly where we want it to be on this axle. okay now I can't really show it to you um, on the actual um, chop saw or the miter stand I should say but what they ended up doing to hold this in place is they basically punched the metal right here and it kind of created these little flanges that kind of stuck out a little bit and so obviously you don't have a nut and a washer you slide the wheel on and it kind of butts up against the that little extrusion and then it's held in place by the nut and the washer so we're gonna simulate that um, on the shaft so it's basically like a stamp if you want to call it that and again I wish I could show you what it looks like in real life but um, I don't want to hold the, the whole <laughs> stand up to you 
So I'm going to activate the um, wheel shaft. So let me kind of minimize some of this stuff here. Because I'm working on this part, right? And so I always want to make sure I'm, I'm working on the active component. I'm going to be modifying this. And what I want to do is I want to create a sketch that runs through the middle of this shaft or this axle. Well, I could use an offset plane and do measurements and all this kind of stuff, but please don't. You, that, you run the risk of making a mistake by doing that. So we're going to let Fusion do the work for me. So I'm going to go into this Construct menu, and there's a cool one here called Plane at an Angle. Now notice it says it's asking for a line, and so I can't click on this axle here. However, there is an axis through a cylinder. So I'm going to click on Axis through a Cylinder, What's the face? I'll go ahead and click on this and notice it created a line. So it's an axis that's going right through the center of that cylinder. I'll say OK. I can change the, the length of it, the endpoints of it, all that kind of stuff. So I'll just leave it there. Now I could come in and say, plane at an angle, what's the line? And you'll notice it allows me to select that line and it's putting a plane, we can see right through the center of the axle. And I can even specify what angle I want this plane to be at, 45 degrees, 90 degrees, it doesn't really matter, but it's rotating around that line. And honestly, all I need is just a plane on that line. I don't even have to set the angle. I'm just gonna leave it at zero. And I now have a plane that slices right through the center of the axle. I'll go ahead and now create a sketch on that. Here's another tip. If for whatever reason it rotates for you, and you'll notice the word top is straight across to the right. I, I get this question a lot. Why does it rotate at 90 degrees? It didn't. <laughs> it's actually rotated in the correct orientation. We're looking straight down at the top. And you know, our stand basically goes left to right and our wheels kind of go north to south. And so, you know, if I want to rotate this, I can just hover over this cube and these two little arms appear. And I'm just going to click on that guy. And now notice the direction of the word top. Okay, and this is now oriented the way I want. We're not physically rotating the parts. We're just rotating the piece of paper we're looking down on, basically. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, so now I need to create some geometry for this little stamp that we're going to be creating. So I'm going to project some geometry. Now I've mentioned this before, but I'm going to highlight it again. Cylindrical objects, when the selection filter is set to specified entities, there really isn't an edge. <laughs> the only edge on a cylinder is at the very end and the other end. But there isn't really an edge here because it's a, it's a spherical or cylindrical shape, right? If I change my selection filter to bodies, it's almost like it's doing a silhouette. And you can kind of see it. Watch over here. It's going to highlight it kind of red. You can kind of see that. So I'm going to click on that body there. And I'm going to click on this body here. And you can see how it's projecting like a silhouette or a shadow of it. And sure enough, there's those cylindrical edges were projected. Same thing with the axle. Um, so let me turn that guy off. It's going to turn off all the sketch. Yeah. Um, there you go. You can kind of see it projected all the way around. So I like to use that option every so often. By default, it's usually set to specified entities, but on cylindrical objects, I always use bodies. So now I have an actual edge I can catch to. So let's do a rectangle. And I'm just going to pick near this edge. Let's zoom up a little bit. You can see it snapped to that edge because we projected it. So I'll go ahead and click there. And I want to do a centered rectangle. So I'm just going to click somewhere, do a centered rectangle. And the overall width is 4 and height is 4. 
I'll say OK. And I want it to be a very specific distance from that wheel. And we're actually using the wheel to help us specify where the stamp needs to be. And I, want, I just want a one millimeter gap right there. And so we can kind of see it moved my rectangle. It's fully defined. I'll finish my sketch. And we're going to use this profile. Now here's another tip. I show this a lot. It's wanting to select the cylinder, but I want to grab the profile. But if I click, it's grabbing the cylinder. So I'm going to click and hold for about half a second. And you can see it's going to probe through. So the very first thing it hits is the face, which makes sense. Then the next thing it finds is the profile, then other faces, even on other bodies and stuff like that. Okay. So I'm going to pick on this profile. So great way, instead of having to come over here and turn parts on and off and all that kind of stuff, just click and hold. Boom, there it is. I'll add this other profile. And I'm going to say extrude. We're actually going to use this same profile to, um, that we're creating the stamp with to basically remove material. And then we're going to use the same profile to add material. So you can kind of see I'm kind of machining some stuff away. And I obviously want to do this symmetrically. I'm going to have it use that profile to kind of cut all the way through. And you can see that there. And the distance doesn't matter in this case. I'll just go ahead and say OK. And we just created like this little notch. Well, I'm going to come in here and turn that sketch back on. So I'll expand, open my sketches, turn that sketch back on. And then I'll select those profiles again. I'm going to say extrude. And this time when I start to drag, you're going to see it's going to create uh, an actual object instead of cutting away. I want to do symmetric also. So I'm going to say symmetric. And we can see that it's adding that geometry in both directions. And I want the whole length. Right now it's going basically two millimeters up and two millimeters down. I'm going to say the whole length. I want to be a total of um, two millimeters in this case. Okay. I'll say okay. Let's turn off our sketch so it kind of simplifies things a little bit. And there is basically the representation of the stamp. And you can kind of see, sure enough, they just brought something down and it kind of squished the metal out in both directions. And that's what's holding this little hub in place. Now I want one on the other side. And a lot of people would say, okay, you could mirror that. And you absolutely could, but I'd have to create a mirror plane. I have the access to do that. But here's a cool trick. And actually, um, a customer showed this to me. I didn't even think about this. In fact, I think it was Blaze Barrett, if I remember correctly. And Blaze has been on our live streams before. He's an incredible Fusion user. So I think he showed me this trick. So I'm going to go to create pattern, circular pattern. So I'm not doing a mirror. I'm actually going to create a circular pattern. And notice the type by default is usually set to faces. I'm going to change this to features. And I'm going to select both of these extrude features, the one that kind of machined some stuff away and the one that kind of added that little tab. So I'm selecting both of those features. And now it's asking for an axis. Well, I could pick on the cylinder. I could pick on the axis line. It really doesn't matter in this case. I'm just going to click on the cylinder. And notice by default, it does a quantity of three. Well, I could change that to a quantity of two. And it's basically patterning it to the other side. I'll say OK. And instead of having to do a mirror and create extra planes and all that kind of stuff, I just used a circular pattern. And there is our little groove that kind of holds the wheel in place. OK, the last thing we're going to do here is obviously put this on the other side over here, too. Now, one thing I noticed is I'm going to um, fold this guy up a little bit. So this is my wheel assembly. In fact, I'll go ahead and activate it. And these brackets are part of my wheel assembly. And in reality, I kind of want them to be more part of the table. 
and just the axle, the wheel, the nuts, and the washer be my wheel assembly. Because you kind of think of that, right? When you take these wheels off, you're not actually physically taking these sheet metal parts off either. It's just the axle and the nuts and the wheel and stuff. However, these wheel mounts are in my wheel assembly. Well, I'm just going to highlight them. I'm going to select them. I'm just going to drag those into my table assembly. And now this kind of makes sense, right? Here's my wheel assembly. It's just the axle, the nuts, the washer, the hub, and the wheel. And the sheet metal parts are actually part of the table. And to me that makes sense. And the reason I'm showing this is as you're designing, you're going to put things some, you know, not in the wrong location, but you're going to kind of design things and you're going to down the road be like, oh, you know what? I want that to be in this sub assembly or I want it to be over here or whatever. Totally fine with Fusion. I can just move them into a different location. Um, same thing here. I don't want to see this axis. So I'm going to select it. We'll show hide. Turns that guy off. Now I can come in here and mirror this wheel assembly. So let's go to create, mirror, notice it says components. I'll just click on the wheel assembly and you can see it highlights everything. And it's asking for a mirror plane. So I'm going to click on select but nothing shows up except for my origin which is in the wrong location. However, I can expand, open my construction folder here I, and turn on that plane there. That's the one that kind of slices down through the center of it. So I'll go ahead and click on that plane. We get a nice visual preview of what that's going to look like. I'll say OK. I'll turn that guy back off. And now we have... Oops. one wheel assembly and the other wheel assembly. So there's that guy there also. Now, as I've been going through, sometimes I've been creating rigid joints and stuff like that, but watch what happens when I grab this wheel. There's no joint putting it on the axle. However, you see the hub and the uh, tire move together because we created a rigid joint a while back. Um, I will obviously want to fix this. I also want it so when one wheel rotates, the other wheel rotates. And there's a couple different ways I could do that. But uh, for example, with um, I could use motion links and have a revolute joint over here and a revolute joint over here and then link those two joints together. I could do that. But in this case, I'm just going to go ahead and create a rigid group between both the wheels. So let me expand these guys open real quick so I can kind of see what's going on here. So I'm going to select that wheel hub and that wheel, that wheel hub and that wheel, and I'll just right mouse click and say rigid group. Now sometimes you might it might say hey there's already one that exists do you want to continue? I'm going to say yes. I'll say OK, and now when I move one, the other one has to move with it, right? And then all I have to do is create one revolute joint, and that one's going to move with it. So you can kind of think of it as a rigid group. And the way I look at this is like if I'm dragging this on the ground, if one wheel rotates, the other one has to also. So that's kind of how I'm looking at it. Now we, we've positioned this. It's in the correct location, but it doesn't have... A joint that we need. But because it's in the correct position, I can use an as built joint. So I'm going to say as built joint. I can specify is it rigid, revolute, slider, etc. I'm going to say revolute. What are the components? I'm just going to say, you know, this wheel hub, maybe with this axle here. And then it's asking for a snap. And I'm just going to get kind of near um, this axle and we can kind of just click on one of those points and we can see it's going to preview what that looks like. I'll say OK and notice I need to do some other things here. Let me let me 
ground this guy. So that's the wheel shaft. Let me just go ahead and ground that right now and see if that fixes. Yeah, there we go. I didn't have it grounded. But now if I rotate one tire, the other one rotates also. Okay, and I'm going to save. So I'm going to say end of session. I think it's a six, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> um, let me go into session six. Say okay. Okay, um, let me look at the uh, no questions. Wow. Um, usually we have a couple questions. Angelo, I appreciate you probably been going through and answering those for me. I appreciate that. Um, hopefully you find this series useful. We're kind of going through and you know creating all of these parts. We're assembling them together. Again, there's multiple different ways we could go about doing this. I'm not saying the way I'm doing it is the exact perfect way. It's one of the ways. We could have created these parts separately and then assembled them into you know together using joints when they were once they were all created. Um, I'm doing what I call in context design, where we're basically using existing models to help us with our new parts with their design. So we're kind of doing an in context example here. Um, stay tuned. Next week, Angelo is going to be doing a, a, a cam live stream, so make sure you tune in for that. Um, also, check the um, YouTube channel for that furniture live stream. It was like a week-long series. I think it was about five of them or six of them, if I remember correctly. Um, oh, and I wanted to show one more thing real quick. I told you I would. Um, one of the other new things that we've added is this trace parts supplier. This is really kind of cool. Um, it's kind of like McMaster Car, but you can see we've got hundreds of, of customer um, 3D models in here. I'm just going to, you know, like 3M, ABB, etc. I'm just going to scroll through real quick uh, so you can kind of see. I mean, there is a ton of them in here, like Bimba cylinders, and, you know, you'll probably recognize a, lo a lot of these. And I can even search. So, for example, I could do. Um, uh, drag chain or something like that. I'm just gonna say drag chain and you can see over here well I want to do okay it's called a cable carrier so I'm gonna cl click on that I can specify what the length is I'm just gonna randomly click on one of those and it basically filters everything for me so here are all the different options for the drag chain from this particular customer I'm just gonna pick this top one here and what's neat is and you, you can do vices, um, tombstones, any, pretty much anything you can think of is in here. It actually has a 3D representation. You can, you know, pan, zoom, and rotate and take a look at, you know, the end pieces, etc. But then notice right here, download right into Fusion 360. So I'm just going to click on that. Um, make sure I'm signed in. I'll say keep me signed in. Um, and it'll download it right into Fusion 360. So it's it's very similar to McMaster Car, but I mean, times a thousand, right? It's it's pretty amazing. Um, so let me see. I'll say download, and it should come up and say, um, "Yep, your request is being processed." And one thing I didn't show, I'll scroll down. You can actually specify all these, like what's the bend radius, what's the inner width, you know what kind of mounting and all this kind of stuff. And you can see your file is ready for download. So I'll click there and it will let me uh, download the model. And you can kind of see it running in the background and it'll bring it into my assembly. So just amazing all the stuff that's in here. Um, so yeah, there you go, there's, there's the drag chain. And the other thing I'll just kind of show here real quick. Um, so here's that that drag chain it, it put it in the my active assembly which is kind of cool I can convert these to components I'm not gonna do all of these but um, I'll pick on that guy there ground him and then I can use as-built joints so I'll just say as-built joint I'm gonna say I want that guy and that guy to revolve there I'll say okay repeat Oops, um, repeat my last command. I'll just say that guy and that guy. 
you know, and I would just have to do this a couple times. And now I have, you know, this actually working <laughs> with the drag chain, you know, and it's already where it needs to be, all that kind of stuff. So pretty cool. Um, you play around with that. Uh, you do have to sign up for it, but it's free. You just have to create an account. Um, but it's really amazing what's in there. So with that, I'll check the questions. Okay, so there is one. Um, the, okay, let me read this really quick. I apologize, it's on my other screen. Um, are there rules for when you can move components and when you can't? I feel like sometimes it doesn't allow me. Um, this is from Ethan. So yeah, this is a really good question. You know, are there rules? And the answer is yes and no. Um, so for example, I grounded this part and so I physically can't move this anymore, right? I'd have to unground that. One of the tips that I, um, I'll go back to the camera. One of the tips that I do with joints is start simple and kind of build from the ground up. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's say we're designing a robotic arm. I'm gonna ground the base. Then the next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set a revolute for the whole arm assembly and I'm gonna test that. Once I've created that revolute, I drag it around, kind of see is that the result that I want. Then I might say, okay, now create the elbow to the arm and test that. I might group things together and test that. So you hear me using the word test quite a bit. You know, you wanna get the results um, the way you expect them to as you're going along. I see all the time people are like, you know, do a revolute, revolute, rigid, rigid, all this kind of stuff, and then they go to animate it and it like freezes. It doesn't do anything. And that's because one of the joints is being controlled or limited by a different one. Maybe it's a rigid joint or a slider um, that has, you know, no movement or something like that. So my tip is test as you go through and do one at a time, honestly. And it's really quick to just drag it around and make sure that it works. So and then revert the position and go to your next joint. So, um, and I'll, I'll be honest, when sometimes customers like, how come this doesn't work? I end up suppressing all of the joints and basically starting from the ground up to kind of see what is causing things not to work. So hopefully that answers your question. So thanks for asking. Um, let me see if there's any other questions. It looks like that's about it. Um, Moving components from the wheel assembly. Oh, I got you. Okay, so he was referring to moving components from the wheel assembly into the table assembly. So yes, um, let me, uh, what I did there is I just dragged, you know, those two parts from the wheel assembly up into the, the table assembly, the two wheel mounts, right? I mean, I could, like right now, I could grab the um, these wheels so you notice I have wheel assembly one and wheel assembly mirror. I could come in here and say, I want to create a new component and I'll call it, you know, both wheels assembly or something like that. And so I now have a new component that's totally empty, but I could grab that guy and drop it in there and grab this guy, hopefully it'll let me drop right onto it. So notice it says some components have been moved and that's because I was moving things around. So I'm going to continue and let me drag that onto there. And now you'll see that <laughs> both of my wheels are now underneath this both wheels assembly. I can turn that on and off and they're both underneath that. So I do this all the time where we started with, by drawing just the hub and then the wheel and stuff like that. Then we added in the axle and then we did all this kind of stuff. We moved the wheel mounts out. I created a new component, moved these guys in. So, so yeah, hopefully that shows it's actually pretty fluid, pretty easy to move things around and reorganize um, using components. So. Okay, with that, um, we're at the top of the hour. Again, thank you all for attending. Uh, hopefully you found this useful and we will see you on a future live stream. Take it easy, have fun fusioning.